all about the case. As soon as his sister Suzanne was arrested, his maternal uncle Miguel convinced his nephew Andreas to spend some time at his house, but he put his foot down, insisting on living alone in the mansion. Among the arguments of the 16-year-old was that in two years he would be of legal age and would become the owner of the house and other assets left by his parents, valued at the time at $3 million, Miguel started to finance the housing of the boy, and Rinalva the family maid was kept in the mansion to assist him. Rinalva's relationship with Andreas was friendly for the first few days. The young man, however, took on the role of demanding boss and began to tease his only employee. He complained about the excess salt in the food, the cleaning and even t-shirts that he wanted to wear, but they were in the laundry basket for ironing. The final straw occurred in the third month of living with Rinalva. The maid was at home with her family when she received a call from Andreas. Ruff, accusing Rinalva of theft. Andreas had missed a perfume that was on top of his dresser. She was very angry about this situation. The next day, the maid stopped by Miguel's house and asked for the bills. During the period in which she had the stomach to work at the Rich Thofen mansion after the crime, Rinalva received three letters from Suzanne, but never replied to them. With Rinalva's dismissal, Andreas was forced to live with his uncle Miguel, who had cut ties with Suzanne since confessing to having had his parents killed. Before moving, the teenager went to Suzanne's room, took his sister's teddy bear in which the 22 caliber Beretta he had been given by Daniel was hidden and took it to his uncle's house. The first conflict between Miguel and Andreas will occur later, precisely because of this weapon. The second clash between the uncle and nephew was fought because the boy decided to visit his sister in the penitentiary. Miguel refused to take him. Andreas decided to ask Amanda, Suzanne's best college friend, for this favor. When she got a call from the boy, she remembered her friend's plea to take care of Andreas as if he were her brother and decided to take him to the penitentiary one Sunday morning. To get a password, the two had to get up early in a line with more than 500 people. Amanda and Andreas stood for over three hours. Amanda told Andreas that this visit could do harm, and he denied it, saying it did not hurt because he was not angry with his sister. Amanda asks Andreas, are you sure? The boy answers, yes, I lost my father my mother, and my best friend. Now I only have Suzanne, I'll stay by her side. Suzanne was in the penitentiary yard, sitting on a bench alone, smoking and reading. Anxious, she hugged her brother for a long time and thanked her friend for taking her brother to visit her. The boy made it clear that his uncle forbade him to see her. The three talked about various subjects, except crime. It was as if the tragedy hadn't happened. Andreas passed his sister a letter written by Daniel. In one of the passages, the pilot said that he kept in jail a daily struggle to preserve his sanity, he assumed he had tried on his life three times and that he was also being haunted by the ghosts of the rich Thofen couple. Suzanne wasn't moved, she put the letter in her pocket and started talking about the threats received inside the jail and the need to get out of there to prove her innocence. Suzanne made it clear that she needed a good lawyer and that they were expensive. In other words, I would need money. Uncle Miguel said you'll rot in here with nothing, because you won't have the right to an inheritance, the brother argued. And what do you think about it? He is right. Do I deserve to die in here? I deserve it. Andreas lowered his head and didn't respond. Amanda broke that heavy atmosphere by bringing up another subject. At the end of the visit Suzanne asked Andreas for the Beretta given to him by Daniel. Where did you hide the weapon? I wanted to know Suzanne. Inside your teddy bear. Take it out of there without Uncle Miguel noticing and a disappearance in it. If the police find you, they will think you are involved in the crime warned the sister. Suzanne begged Amanda and Andreas to come back next Sunday as she would need an important favor. That same day after the visit of her brother and friend, Suzanne received a visit from her two lawyers, Denivaldo Barney and his son Barney Jr. Suzanne made it clear to them that her uncle would not let her receive the inheritance. The lawyers imagined that this could happen, so he asked Suzanne to convince Andreas to stop him. That's when the lawyer suggested that Suzanne ask Andreas to write a handwritten letter saying that he is against his inheritance exclusion. In the middle of the week Andreas complied with his sister's order. He went to Miguel's backyard and started digging a hole near a lemon tree. Upon being caught by his uncle, the teenager said he was digging a pit to bury one of his dogs, who had allegedly died, intoxicated by cleaning supplies. Miguel was suspicious, but did not make any repression. He left it like that, the boy frantically working with a shovel. 
The next day, Miguel went to the place and removed the earth and there was the Beretta and a bullet case. Pressured by the family, Andreas confessed that he had received the gun as a gift from Daniel when he turned 15. To get rid of the gun and incriminate even more Suzanne and Daniel, Miguel took the Beretta to the public prosecutor and told the story passed on by his nephew. The following Sunday, as agreed, Andreas and Amanda returned to the penitentiary. Suzanne's brother, this time, was silent. Amanda tried to make conversation, but the boy didn't interact. When he arrived at the jail's courtyard, Andreas this time, seemed full of questions and before he even greeted his sister, he fired at her. Why did you do that? Why did you kill our parents? Because, he asked in a choked voice, trembling with emotion. In silence Suzanne was, in silence she remained for a long time. With her head down, she began to cry sobbing. Upon witnessing this scene of such embarrassment and family intimacy, Amanda decided to take a walk in the patio. Suzanne wiped away her tears and began to speak. She told her brother that she was being threatened with death by the women of the PCC. The boy was not moved and insisted on his sister's answer to the motives of the crime. Suzanne then started the old story that she was manipulated by Daniel and always benefited from not having laid a finger on her parents, throwing the responsibility for the double murder onto her brother Cravinhos. Andreas hugged his sister, in a dramatic scene watered with tears. At the height of emotion, he passed the notebook and pen to his brother and asked him to write a letter at that moment. The teenager accepted. Suzanne then began to dictate, while her brother was writing. I wanted Sue, I miss you so much. You know I haven't been visiting you because Uncle Miguel forbade me to see you. I'm against it. I am also against you being excluded from the inheritance. That was his and Dr. Sid's idea. I remain by your side. I love you. Do your brother, Andreas. Suzanne ripped the page out of the notebook and put it in her pocket. Andreas at another time said he wrote such a letter under emotional blackmail. Amanda was back in time to hear all about the letter written that day. Amanda, seeing that place full of inmates with her relatives, promised herself never to go back to that place and get away from Suzanne. He didn't answer and didn't even write letters to his friend. Andreas, realizing how cunning his sister was, also decided to cut ties and didn't go there again. When confronted by the public ministry still about the gun buried in the backyard, at that moment Andreas made it clear that he was next to his sister. I never wanted to obstruct the investigations or the process that investigates the death of my parents. But I also don't want to harm my sister. Prison costs me a lot of suffering. I will help you with whatever it takes, as it is my duty as a member of the family. Declared. Then the teenager passed on to the members of the public ministry the teddy bear with a tear in its belly, where he had removed the Beretta given to him by Daniel. Andreas' compassion for Suzanne didn't last long. Convinced by his uncle, he definitely broke with his murderous sister. On August 27, 2004 Suzanne received great news from her lawyers, claiming that the client did not pose a risk to society, her lawyers asked for a habeas corpus allowing Suzanne the grace to await the trial in freedom. With the benefit, the killer was free, light and free for nine months. On the 28th of the 7th of 2005 the famous prey leaves the penitentiary. Still without a period of freedom, but still free awaiting trial and, without money, Suzanne began to charge her share of the inheritance from the family. She insisted on inventorying everything that would have been left by her parents. The first step was to make a list of everything inside the rich Dauphin mansion. Suzanne would have labeled furniture, appliances, rugs, pillows and even cutlery in cups, claiming that all the crockery in the house was imported. Afraid of being stolen, the blonde photographed the pictures on the wall. Indignant with his niece's boldness, Uncle Miguel decided to enter with an interpolation. Suzanne called Andres to try to make him aware of her situation. The assassin called the landline at Uncle Miguel's house and his brother answered, but the boy was silent during most of the conversation. Andreas, this is Suzanne. The boy was silent. I know you are there. Look, I'm out of money to pay the lawyers. I will be convicted and spend 64 years in jail if I don't have a good defense. It helps me. The brother remained silent. Please my brother. Let's speed up the inheritance sharing process. Andreas didn't make a peep. I've already ordered a survey of everything we have to share, he continued. Talk to me please. I love you. I love you. I love you. Let's meet to talk about inheritance, please. I'm going to stop by at Uncle Miguel's house tonight. Upon hearing the announcement of this visit, Andreas decided to speak to his sister. I am afraid of you. Heard. Fear. He responded by slamming the phone in Suzanne's face. Andreas' panic for his sister was no accident. Uncle Miguel worked hard to make Suzanne's skull for the boy. The argument ran as follows, 
she had her parents killed to get half of the inheritance. Logically, she might as well kill her brother and have it all by herself. That threat would become more evident now, with the family's desire to exclude her from the will. Andreas then became afraid of being murdered. While in jail, Suzanne exchanged letters with her paternal grandmother, Margot Guthaman, 80 years old at the time. In one of these correspondences, the old woman said she forgives her granddaughter for murdering Manfred, Margot's youngest son. The grandmother lived alone in an apartment valued at 1 million reis and went to court to register that she had no resentment towards Suzanne. The granddaughter took advantage of her freedom to visit her grandmother. In these meetings, Suzanne complained about Miguel, who is an uncle on her mother's side. Margot thought it absurd to deny her granddaughter access to the inheritance. Using a Polaroid camera, the one that reveals the image as soon as it is taken, Suzanne took several photos of her face with her grandmother and took them with her. The next day, Andreas arrived from class and, as he got off the school bus, he saw a car with tinted windows near Uncle Miguel's house. He was walking along the sidewalk and the car was approaching. The boy quickened his steps and the vehicle increased speed to catch up with him. Andreas ran and the car lurched forward, braking sharply in front of him. Suzanne, laughing, rolled down the window and revealed herself behind the wheel. The boy ignored her and went into the house. Alone, he went to the kitchen to get a glass of water to recover from the shock. As he approached the refrigerator, Andreas felt chills. Suzanne had entered the house and had nailed a photo with her grandmother Margot to the fridge door with a magnet. In a panic, the teenager called his uncle and the two went to a police station to register the report alleging that Andreas was being threatened by his sister. Suzanne was then prohibited, by a restraining order, from contacting her brother. The following week, Andreas went to court to definitively exclude Suzanne from the will, claiming that Loira killed her parents for financial reasons. The teenager won the lawsuit and ended up inheriting all his parents' assets alone. Suzanne never saw Andreas again. Many years later, on the outing in May 2017, Suzanne received a mysterious message on her cell phone. Hey, how's it going? Everything in you? Answer me she. Everything's good. Tell me something. Are you who I'm thinking? It depends. Who do you think I am? Who am? I won't name names, wrote the other person. If you have my cell number, you must know who I am. Replied Suzanne. I have doubts. I will ask a question. If you get the answer right, you are who I am thinking of. So do it. What's the name of the little dog we had when we were kids? Suzanne was walking through the streets of Angatuba and was shocked when she discovered that her brother, Andreas, was on the other side of the cell phone. The attempt at rapprochement between the two was first revealed by a Polka magazine, in October 2019. Suzanne and Andreas set up a meeting 15 years after they had last met, in the courtyard of the capital's women's penitentiary, when she manipulated him to write a letter and thus conquer half of the parents' inheritance. By the rules of the semi-open regime, the blonde could not leave Angatuba during the outings. With this restriction, she arranged with his brother to go from Sao Paulo to the municipality of 20,000 inhabitants. The young man, 29 years old at the time, accepted. A scholar, he already had a degree in pharmacy and biochemistry from the University of Sao Paulo and a PhD in organic chemistry from the Institute of Chemistry at USP. Anxious, Suzanne tidied up the house and had a special lunch prepared, but Andreas didn't show up. The young man even took the Raposo Tavares bus station towards Angatuba to find his sister. However, extremely emotional, lacking courage and psychologically shaken as he brooded over the family's tragic past, Andreas returned midway without giving any explanation to his sister. Distraught, the young man drank, used drugs until he lost consciousness and ended up completely freaked out in the farmhouse Monte Alegre neighborhood, in the south of Sao Paulo. When trying to jump over the wall of a house, Andreas was arrested by the military police and taken to the police station. From there, he went to a psychiatric hospital with all torn clothes and wounds all over his body. At the time, it was reported that Andreas was rescued from Cracolandia, the famous drug-free trade zone in downtown Sao Paulo. Andreas, however, was never there. Advised by lawyers, Suzanne decided not to look for Andreas anymore. The two never spoke again. Andreas remains in family care and has never appeared in the media again. And that was all about the Andreas Albert von Richthofen case. Not to miss any case, subscribe to our channel, leave your like that helps us a lot.